but I'm going to move on to our next speaker uh, and introduce Dr. Leslie Rattan, who is a registered psychologist practicing in both clinical neuropsychology and psychology. Uh, she splits her time between outpatient acquired brain injury neuro rehab at Toronto Rehab Institute and private practice. She's interested in the enduring effects of concussion and has been involved with the Canadian Concussion Center for the past several years, providing education and support workshops, and more recently, moderating webinars to individuals experiencing persisting post-concussion symptoms and their families, as well as healthcare providers. She's involved in research with the Hull Ellis Concussion Clinic at Toronto Rehab and uh, looking at prospectively in, uh, the individuals that have suffered concussions and their recovery course. She co-chairs the UHM um, Psychology Professional Council and Psychology Education and Training Committee, and has been supervising graduate level practicum students, pre-doctoral residents and postdoctoral fellows for several years. So I will pass you on to Dr. Rattan. Thanks very much, Carmela. Okay, hopefully everyone can see my screen. Well, good morning. Uh, I'm really happy to be here and I'm speaking today uh, with regard to the Toronto concussion study and the impact of pre-injury depression and anxiety on acute post-concussion psychological symptom expression and recovery. Uh, so just to start off with, I know conflicts of interest. So today's learning objectives are to determine the impact of pre-injury depression or anxiety on symptoms at week one post-concussion, as well as on recovery at week eight, as well as the impact of psychological symptoms at week one and two post-concussion on recovery at week eight. So what we know about concussion, uh, I think we probably all know that it's the highest, it's the most frequent type of traumatic brain injury that there is. A relatively recent study uh, noted that there were about 150,000 per year in Ontario. And we know that concussion uh, is really an inju injury of individual differences. And at this time, we have no gold standard diagnostic test. It really is dependent on self-reported symptoms. We also don't have any accurate method to predict recovery. That is who is going to get better and who may struggle for a longer period of time. We know that the majority of individuals, so about 85% of individuals tend to recover relatively quickly within the first two to three weeks. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, at least 15% go on to have more protracted recoveries. And generally speaking as well, most of the research that is done is often done in athletes and adolescents and not the general population. So as a result, the Hull Ellis Concussion and Research Center uh, was started at Toronto Rehab. It's actually named after hockey legends, Dennis Hull and Ron Ellis. Uh, and this uh, started with a fundraising gala back in 2014. Uh, Ron Ellis has the unique distinction of having uh, been a lifelong Toronto Maple Leaf and, and won the Stanley Cup back in 67. And both of them uh, played in the Summit Series in 1972. Uh, so this was sort of the, the beginning. Uh, and this was funded by the generosity of donors under the governance of the Toronto Rehab Foundation. So the clinic, um, in terms of the purpose and, and vision, uh, the idea was to have a rapid access clinic and looking at collecting data on dozens of variables prospectively to better understand who would and who wouldn't get better quickly. Uh, also to develop specific care pathways for the groups that need it most, hence back to the rapid access clinic. Uh, looking at innovation, assessment and education, now, in terms of our referral and recruitment process, so patients are referred from a number of emergency departments across Toronto, uh, the Toronto General, the Toronto Western, Mount Sinai, Michael Guerin, St. Joseph's, and Sunnybrook. And patients are seen within a week of their injury, and all patients are offered 
to participate in the research if they so desire. Uh, they're followed clinically for eight weeks and if they participate in research for 16 weeks. So in terms of the clinical care that's provided, they are seen by, they have physician assessment and follow-up. Education about concussion, symptom trajectory and symptom management is provided as is support and reassurance, as well as advice on returning to pre-injury activities such as work, school, physical exercise, and so on. So in terms of our research methods, this is a prospective naturalistic cohort study. And the individuals uh, that we're looking at are adults aged 17 to 85. Uh, as noted, they've been diagnosed with, a, with an acute concussion in an emergency department in Toronto. Their Glasgow Coma Scale is between 13 and 15. None of them are actually admitted to hospital. Uh, they don't have neurological or positive neuroimaging findings. Uh, as noted already, they're seen within the first week of their injury. And finally, uh, individuals who are eligible for compensation, so uh, where injuries may have been sustained in the workplace or in a motor vehicle accident, uh, they too are not seen in the clinic. So some of the data capture uh, the degree of subjective complaints. Uh, we use the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Strokes, common data elements, so demographic information, the mechanism, mechanism of injury, and so forth. Uh, we also uh, have objective measurements of cognition and balance, uh, psychological symptoms, and there is multifaceted recovery criteria, including physician assessment. And you'll hear more about the clinic this afternoon when, when Dr. Mark Bailey uh, speaks. So for the purpose of, of my talk, uh, back to psychological predictors of recovery post-concussion. So we know that psychological symptoms are frequently reported in the acute post-concussive period. Uh, and have been suggested to contribute to those prolonged symptoms, as has the presence of pre-injury psychological issues. We know that factors prolonging recovery and their relationship with one another are important to understand, given the impact of delayed recovery on individuals' health-related quality of life. So uh, it follows that identification of prolonged recovery predictors, so if we can figure out who are those people at risk, uh, would allow for more rapid and targeted interventions leading to improved outcomes. So just returning to those same objectives, again, looking at pre-injury depression or anxiety on symptoms at week one, uh, when they are first seen in the clinic, and then on recovery at week eight, and psychological symptoms, the impact of those measured at week one and two on recovery at week eight. So basically patients come into the clinic during week one, uh, we obtain their past medical history, the SCAT is administered. Uh, again, at week two, uh, the SCAT is administered as well as the brief, brief symptom inventory. Now, if patients are low on symptoms, they are followed as needed uh, from, from there. And then at week eight is when the patients are deemed, they're, they're assessed at each week, but at week eight uh, is what we were looking towards whether someone is deemed recovered or not recovered. And that is determined by the physician. In terms of their past medical history, this is self-reported by the participants at their first visit to the clinic. Uh, and it only includes formal diagnoses. So they're asked to select from a list of about 30 possible diagnoses, including an other option. And the options for mental health include depression, anxiety, and other mental illness. So in terms of the symptom measures that we were looking at, uh, one was the SCAT-5 symptom checklist. And as noted, this is given both at week one and then again at week two. And in terms of the symptoms, the emotional symptoms on that one we're highlighting here, uh, there's four of them. So that is being more emotional, irritability, sadness, or feeling nervous or anxious. And elevation was considered when the average score was greater than two, that is greater than mild. And then we had the brief symptom inventory. So this was only administered at week two. 
And the question asked here was, how much of these symptoms distressed or bothered you during the past seven days? And it, uh, the BSI-18 provides three uh, subdomain scores on somatization, depression, and anxiety, and also provides a total or global severity index. This is gender adjusted and elevated, uh, uh, was judged elevated when the T-score was above 63. So in terms of our recovery assessment, how, do, how did we determine whether someone was, was recovered or not? Uh, as I mentioned, this was physician determined. Uh, it's assessed at every appointment. And for this study, week eight was the uh, period that was used and it was a, a yes or no. It was a functional definition of recovery and participants were scored from one to six on, across three domains, domains, those being physical. So things like exercise, cognitively, work or school, uh, and sensory. So sensitivity to light, sound, screens, and so forth. And uh, there was a total score of 18 and participants were deemed recovered if they scored 17 or 18 out of those 18 possible points. In terms of our demographics, we had an N of 473. This was a pre-pandemic data set from February, 2016 to March, 2020. Uh, when we had to halt recruitment. Uh, the average age was 33, 60%, uh, 61% female. Uh, median education was a bachelor's degree, median income 40 to 60,000. And the three most common pre-existing conditions were anxiety, depression, and migraine. And employment status was employed or students. So in terms of what we found, um, you'll see on the left, uh, the top um, visual is pre-existing depression. The one on the bottom is pre-existing anxiety. And what we found was individuals that had pre-existing depression uh, had significantly higher scat emotional symptoms uh, at week one. And that was the same for pre-existing anxiety. Uh, and in terms of SCAT somatic symptoms, it was the same thing. So again, the one reflecting the existence of pre-existing depression and on the bottom anxiety showed uh, statistically significant higher SCAT somatic symptoms at week one. Um, SCAT total symptoms was the same. So again, we're seeing higher at week one SCAT total symptoms for those with those pre-existing psychiatric conditions. So people with pre-injury anxiety and depression are more likely to also have elevated scores on the SCAT total and the somatic and emotional subgroups of the SCAT at week one. So we wondered, you know, could this mean that SCAT scores are reflecting some pre-existing non-concussion component in these individuals? And that will um, require some further, further work. Now, in terms of the impact on recovery, we see that a pre-injury mental health diagnosis on its own, so this is just on its own, is actually not associated with a greater chance of unsuccessful recovery than those without a pre-injury mental health diagnosis. Those with an elevated somatization BSI score at week two have 2.1 greater odds of unsuccessful recovery than those that are not elevated. And those with an elevated emotional score, emotional SCAT score at week one, have 2.7 greater odds of unsuccessful recovery than those that are not elevated. And we just noted moderate correlation between the BSI somatic scores and the SCAT emotional scores. So just to summarize, so it has of course been suggested that pre-existing mental health diagnoses uh, can impact on recovery. In our particular group, uh, we did find that there was an increased risk of acute post-concussion symptoms um, and that acute post-concussion symptoms, uh, certain th those specific ones that I referred to, uh, predict uh, non-recovery at week eight, 
Um, but the existence of the pre-injury depression and anxiety on their own did not, um, uh, did not uh, predict non-recovery. So just to summarize, pre-existing mental health diagnosis is a possible indirect mediator, mediator on recovery through acute post-concussion symptoms, but not a direct one. So the key takeaways here are that pre-injury depression and anxiety were associated with higher SCAT scores at week one, but given the lack of association with recovery, SCAT scores in this group possibly reflect a pre-existing component. And regardless of past mental health diagnoses, elevations in the SCAT emotional items at week one and the BSI somatization scale at week two increased risk of non-recovery at week eight. So suggesting that really paying attention to those things, um, those items uh, could be helpful. Uh, so really important to monitor mood symptoms in the acute post-concussion period for all individuals, regardless of their past mental health history. Uh, so acute mood disturbances post-concussion are a stronger predictor of poor outcome than pre-injury mental health difficulties. Uh, there are some limitations. So lack of causation, the type of analysis was association. And of course, the point at which recovery was measured, uh, which for this particular study was uh, the eight week mark. And finally, I'd just like to say thank you to the co-authors uh, of this, as well as the entire clinical and research team at the Hallelis Concussion and Research Clinic.